Don't touch her. Hello? Hello. <laughs> My name is Rebecca. Thank you so much for giving up your Friday night and joining me this evening. It was a month or maybe six weeks ago that I walked past her. Twice in my hurry, coming and going from my car, aware of her, but unseeing, as we tend to be in our busyness. She was still there the third time I approached the parking lot. And this time, I slowed my pace. I looked at her. I saw her. And she knew it. I could see that she was cold, her jacket was too thin, and so was she. She was standing on an island in the parking lot behind Mariposa Market, rocking back and forth. Her arms wrapped around herself for warmth and maybe comfort. She was panhandling in need of food, warmer clothes, and maybe something else. I don't know. Her eyes conveyed she needed more than money could provide. Still, I reached into my purse and pulled out a $5 bill and gave it to her before she could ask for it. Her voice was soft and embarrassed, and she said, thank you. And she looked at her feet. I didn't leave. I just stood and waited. I think she was surprised that I didn't rush off right away. I asked her if she was okay and tears welled up in her eyes. And so I offered, would you like a hug? She was shocked only for a moment. And then she was in my arms, sobbing and hanging on to me. Maybe we stood there for 10 seconds or maybe it was three minutes, time wasn't real. She shook and wept, and my own cheeks were damp as we stood in the parking lot, people coming and going, looking on or ignoring us. I hugged her like she was my child or my best friend, like she was all that mattered to me in that moment, because she was. I hugged her until she was quiet, her arms relaxed, and she began to let go. I looked into her eyes and she took a long, deep breath. A small, shy smile lifting the corners of her pink, wet cheeks. Another long breath and she said, thank you. You are so very welcome, I said. And then she walked away. And I stood in her place for a long moment and then heading to my car. I said to myself, you've got this. Now you can get through the rest of this day. Because it's the title song for the presentation. So we are going to sing <coughs> To Show by Touching Word, which is a hymn found in Voices United on page 427, but you'll find the words printed on the screen.
Thank you. <laughs> ah, technology. <laughs> I'd like you to take a moment to just take a deep breath, to get comfortable in your seats. Let your legs relax, let your elbows bump whoever you're sitting next to. Just be comfortable where you are. So just a little bit about who I am. Although I was born in Richmond Hill, I grew up in Nova Scotia. I moved back to Ontario in late 1998 after I received my BA in drama from Mount Allison University and relocated to just up the road here in Aurelia in early 2016. While I am many things to many people, what is key to today is that for the past 17 years, I have been a registered massage therapist. And for the last four and a half years, I've also been a minister, still of the learning student variety. I have served Badgeros for the last four and a half years with the addition of Nottawa and Rob Roy for almost a year now. All three churches being found south of Collingwood. As a first year student entering the Atlantic School of Theology in Halifax, Nova Scotia in 2015, our research methods professors warned us that this research project was coming down the pipe in year five. And we should seriously start thinking about what we wanted to research because finding the right question is no easy task. It wasn't until my third year that the idea of a research question that married my two callings in life, ministry and massage therapy, finally rose to the surface. Taking the two things I feel most passionate about outside of my beautiful and well-hugged children felt natural. But it was not until a few weeks before my research class began this July that my research questions finally started taking shape. As a registered massage therapist for the past 17 years, I know firsthand the healing and connective power of positive touch and the devastation and disconnect that negative touch or no touch can bring. When I combined Reiki with my massage practice over a decade ago and began to channel the universal life energy, which for me is God, while massaging my overall treatments Healthfulness increased in ways I could not have anticipated. Client satisfaction increased, and the efficiency and effectivity of my treatments improved. When I shifted from massage to ministry as my main focus, I quickly realized that there was a lot of room for positive touch in our church communities as well. Many clients, especially our older ones, come in for a massage for an hour of conversation and more importantly, a positive touch. I noticed that many of my church congregants also fit the same demographic. And for this group, touch is often significantly missing from their lives as their children move away and their friends and spouses pass. Understanding the value of positive touch coupled with the realization that we seem to be in a touch adverse time in our society as well as seeing firsthand how damaging that can be brought me to my next question. Are we as clergy responsible for more than just the mind and soul aspects of our spiritual well-being of our congregation? It seems that in our current litigious and touch adverse climate, touch has become something of a four letter word as it were. And that often means that we are hesitant to wade into a hug or some, some supportive touch even if it is asked for or consent has been given. This is especially true in one-on-one -on -one pastoral counseling sessions, which is where many clergy do much of their direct pastoral care. So with the question, what is the experience of consented human touch in pastoral ministry before me, approved and encouraged by my classmates and professor, and with the help of six brave souls willing to talk to me about their experience of touch within their own faith, lives of faith, I waded in to find out if we undergo a deepening or change in how we experience our faith when we include or exclude touch as part of our faithful practice. The methodology, methodology I used for this research study was narrative inquiry. This method lends itself to the study because I collected stories and recorded experience of, of experiences of parishioners who have sought out pastoral care 
or experience pastoral care in other aspects of their faith life, such as in worship, to discover if the presence or absence of positive consent to touch plays a role in its effectiveness. According to Sharon Miriam and Elizabeth Tisdall in their book, Qualitative Research, stories have moved to the center stage as a source of understanding the meaning of human experience. My goal was to achieve an understanding of experiences parishioners have in moments of pastoral care through the collection of their firsthand experience shared through the telling of their stories. I interviewed six people who attended the United Church of Canada. I stayed close to home because I felt like face-to-face -face interviews were an important aspect of this study. The participants were selected by a non-probability purposeful sampling. An invitation was sent out to congregations with a reasonable drive from my home. And I did my best out of the responses to select a diverse group of participants, which demonstrate a balance of genders and ages. The interviews were predominantly held in public libraries. <clears throat> so is touch an important part of our faith? I believe it is. We sing about touch during our worship services. For example, to show by touch and word, which we just sung. Or the hymn, We Are Wong, One, <clears throat> which in the verse two says, we are one as we share brokenness and fear. In the touch of a hand, there's a sense that God is near. Or I have called you by your name. And in verse three, it says, I know you will need my touch as you go. Feel it pulsing in creation's ebb and flow. And there are others. We're told again and again in the New Testament scripture stories of Jesus healing miracles, which happened with a touch of Jesus' hand. For example, in Matthew, when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and there was a leper who came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Then Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as testimony to them. And there are many other ex such examples. From Mark 1. Or Luke 13. Within our church ceremonies, we use touch through the laying on of hands to convey support and connection to one another. I can tell you that there are long hours of debate among my fellow org graduates on who we, as ordinands, will choose to lay on hands during our ordination ceremony next May 2020. We also invite grandparents and godparents to come and lay their hands on our infants during their baptisms. And I don't need to tell you how important touch is during weddings. Many church communities also incorporate a laying on of hands during their communion liturgies. All of this has resulted in supporting the idea that this research project needed to be done. So what is the experience of consented human touch in pastoral ministry? I believe that experiencing touch is an important part of a vibrant life and that coupled with faith, we as clergy can be aiding our parishioners' overall well-being through the use of touch in our pastoral ministry. How often do we share positive touch outside of our immediate family and close friends? How we as clergy act is equally as important as what we say. 
Are we doing enough? Or is the fear of litigation holding us back from ministering to our congregations the way Jesus taught us? <coughs> A story. Our system has become so reactive that my six-year-old was suspended for being too affectionate, for hugging his friends, for being too close to other children. This set in motion an interrogation of my family, my children, and ultimately as an attack on our East Coast warmth and connection to our other human beings. Oliver has always been affectionate and warm. As a toddler, he was that little guy who leaned on you, climbed on your lap, and hugged his friends when they cried from falling or hurt feelings at daycare. The hands-off, zero-tolerance policy of schools that has enveloped and enveloped our classrooms of our youngest children frowns upon human touch of any kind. And this vilification was at the root of a very stressful time in our family. At six, Oliver was labeled a predator, capable of sexually inappropriate actions because he hugged his friends too much. And this had to be because he'd been a victim, victim of sexual assault, which had caused him to be too close to other children. The investigation ensued. CAS questioned both Oliver and his older brother, causing more stress and anxiety than anything else. I filed a complaint that they caused undue harm to my children. That, of course, was viewed as an attempt to hide something. To make matters worse, their theory was that my eldest child, who struggled with mental health issues was living, and was living in supportive care at the time, was a perpetrator against my two younger children. All of this because a six-year-old little boy was kind and loving to his friends when they were in need. My children were told that hugging people that weren't their immediate family was bad and dangerous. They were made to feel that our family culture of demonstrative affection was dirty, immoral, and bad. For several months, my kids stopped hugging people, tensed up whenever I hugged them, and stopped showing loving care to their friends. Luckily, now, at 14, 19, and 25, the boys have recovered, and this is just a bad memory. We are teaching children that human touch is always negative and inappropriate. As a teacher, I struggle with showing support in a physical manner to my students for fear of reprisal and accusation. Touch is, a he is healing and necessary. Fear and knee-jerk reaction have taken over. Throughout the conversation and interviews I've had over the past few months, I have been delighted to see that there is an interest in the topic of touch in our lives that reaches beyond the end of my nose. What became clear as I asked my interview questions was that A, there were many more questions I wanted to ask that were not on the approved list. There were different questions that needed to be asked in order to dig deeper into the subject matter, and I had made note of those for further reference. And see that touch as an important aspect of our faith life isn't something most consider regularly. While my interviewee's answers came readily, there was only a few instances where someone didn't need to take at least a short pause before answering the question. So I'd like to share with you what I discovered. Not everyone was clear on what I meant by consented touch. For the purpose of my research, what I mean is a handshake, a hug, a comforting arm around the shoulder, or holding a hand with verbal permission. At one time, our clergy were the go-to for care, support, or information, and so on. What became clear in my research is that this is not really the case anymore. <coughs> we seem to only seek out direct pastoral care if we feel that we have no one else to turn to, such as close friends or a spouse or health providers, and only if we feel a very strong connection to that clergy. How long we have known our clergy and how connected we feel 
to them play a very big part. And if we wish for touch to be a part of our pastoral care, or even if we seek it out at all. There was some hesitation around what it meant by pastoral care. And the idea that there was an opportunity for pastoral care to be something other than a talk with our clergy was new to most. The interviewees confirmed my suspicion that we are concerned about how touch is perceived if we offer it. But there are those who feel that asking, for example, if someone would like a hug, lessens the hug's impact, while others thought that a hug had the same effect if we asked to give it before plunging in. Without exception, when I asked the interviewees question three, if touch was important in their overall health and well-being, the answer was a strong and quick yes. Touch has been a strong, had a strong impact in all of their lives. Now, some experiences that were recounted to me were more about giving touch than receiving it. But the interesting thing about touch is you can't give touch without getting touch. Everyone interviewed felt that the touch was critical to their mental and physical well-being, but did not seem to connect it to their spiritual well-being until the time of their interview. Each interviewee, even if they had to think about it for a moment, had a story to tell of a time when they noticed the absence of touch during pastoral exchange. And the same was true about a time when touch was welcome and present during a pastoral exchange. When the idea of worship as a form of pastoral care was suggested, it appeared to be new, but a welcome idea. When we spoke about touch as part of worship, a greeter's hug or handshake, and the passing of the peace were the only way that interviewees currently received faithful, content, consented touch during their active faith practice. The importance of the passing of the peace was very clear. Even to those who were concerned about potential health risks involved in the passing of the peace, especially during our Jeremy winter season. No matter what question was being answered, each person I interviewed had a strong connection to touch in their everyday life. And I hope now has a more conscious connection to the importance of touch in their faith life as well. <clears throat> As we continue to try to find our way in a world that fears the implications of touch, regardless of our faith, it is important to figure out how we proceed without eliminating touch from our lives. Countless studies extol the need of touch for infants in order to fully de develop their brains, their bodies, and social interactions. Other research speaks to us about how important touch is for our senior population for those suffering with dementia or Alzheimer's or living in nursing homes. Overwhelmingly, research points to the importance of touch in our lives for our health, our development, and our happiness. We use touch intentionally to heal, to help, to comfort. But the sphere in which we do this is narrowing dangerously, and our reactiveness is growing exponentially. We need to figure out how to navigate the new million dollar world, consent. Now while research overwhelmingly supports the need for touch in our society, how we navigate this as Christians, as children of God, as siblings to Jesus Christ adds yet another layer of responsibility. We are charged to lead by Jesus' example. What? Do we know Jesus? He loved the underdog, the downtrodden, the weak, and alone. He touched all who were shunned, the unclean, the lepers, the sick. He healed with his hands. He made choices not because they made him popular, but because they were the right thing to do. So, in the name of Jesus, at a time when it is so difficult to reach beyond, to pe out to people beyond the walls of our churches, 
in a tactile, consent-touched way. Let us practice it within the walls of our church. So I'd like you to take a moment, just a moment, to greet all of those around you with the peace of Christ. And in keeping with the title of this presentation, I encourage you to do so with a handshake or a hug or even an elbow bump. The peace of Christ be with you. Well, thank you very much for coming.